This isn't the beginning of the episode, is it? No. In South Florida, kind of the way the winds work coming on and off the ocean, instead of like winter, spring, summer, fall, it's more rainy season, dry season, hot and less hot, basically. Since Rye's been here, I think he brought bad weather. I think he brought the rain. It's never rained this much, ever. Oh, come on. In one week. It's been downpouring. <laughs> Welcome to the Sunshine State. Our lives used to look like this. For years, we got to travel the world, touring with the band I was in. At the same time, we raised chickens and gardened at home in Nashville. Then we changed everything and moved to my hometown to start a little farm by the beach. Now our lives look more like this. We're still learning this farmy lifestyle one sweaty mess at a time, and we're inviting you to learn with us. I'm Mina. And I'm Brendan. And this is Farm to Table. Our bodies, chemically, physically, were made to eat seasonally. The nutrients that we get used to in one season, it's okay that those cycle out. And then we eat different foods for different times of year. So if you think of in most of the country in the U.S., the summertime, in the fall, there's abundant tomatoes and um, peppers and eggplants, things like that. And then. Uh, in the cold and flu season, when it gets cooler, there's different types of greens, there's different types of nutrients in the foods that we have access to depending on the time of year. And then down here in South Florida, one of the things that I love is that citrus season is in the winter when it's that cold and flu season. So there's this natural boost in vitamin C and immunity just straight from nature. It's less about uh, supplements and everything like that, and it's more about just eating what comes naturally during the right time of year. It's really obvious to me that in nature, there's these rhythms that when we work with nature and we don't fight it, we don't try to go against and like push and pull, if we just kind of follow nature's lead in that, that we're gonna be so much more successful. A lot of people try their hand at gardening and at first are gung-ho, so excited, build the raised beds or till up the soil, um, buy their seeds, buy their transplants, put it all together and then nothing grows, nothing works, bugs eat everything, plants die, the seeds don't sprout and it's so discouraging. The easiest change to make to become successful gardening or farming is just to know the seasons and understand that at certain times of year, certain crops are gonna be more successful. Um, at certain times of year, you have to plant seeds straight into the soil versus starting them inside and then bringing them out at the appropriate time. Farming and gardening in the appropriate seasons is key to growing a bountiful harvest. These plants are so funny. Wow. So planting a tomato plant, as you can see, they're sort of special in that roots can grow up the whole stem. So you're gonna have a much stronger plant if you actually plant it this deep. So I'm gonna dig a pretty deep hole. I've removed a lot of the branches going up because this plant is big and healthy. It's gonna have this much more of a root system to start with than just here. It's wet from that rain last night. I could have one gardening tool, it would just be this $10 little hand shovel. That's a shovel? Or hand, <laughs> what is it? A uh, rake. Okay. Oh yeah. Tomatoes are finicky, but they're the first thing that a new gardener tries to grow because they're so delicious. Homegrown tomatoes are epic. So it's discouraging sometimes when they get fungus or they get blossom end rot or they don't do very well. 
but it actually is one of the trickier crops because they're susceptible to disease sometimes. You don't need fancy garden tools. I just grab whatever scissors are closest when I'm running out of the house to work in the garden. Pruning tomatoes is really important for getting the best fruit out of the plant possible and helping it survive as long as possible throughout the season. So if you've ever grown tomatoes, you've for sure seen this sort of crumb on the leaves. It's usually called blight. There's all different types of diseases that tomatoes can get because they're a little finicky. Always make sure your leaves are never touching the soil. Like this is a major no-no. So I'm gonna fix this plant just like that. See these upper leaves are really healthy and totally fine. That's gonna grow into a humongous tomato plant, but touching the soil with the leaves will for sure lead to disease. So practically speaking, how do we embrace the seasons? If you really want to grow food, the best thing that you can do is use a planting calendar. And if you don't know what that is, totally fine. Come find me on Instagram at The Dirt Academy or my website, thedirtacademy.com, and I have a resource page with links to some of my favorite tools. You can literally type in your zip code and it tells you, here's an entire list of vegetables and fruits that you can grow where you live, what month to plant them, how to take care of them, and then what month you're gonna be harvesting. The second best way to eat seasonally that I've ever experienced, if you don't wanna grow this whole slew of veggies yourself, it's called a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture. And it's a way for local farmers to get to know the people in the community by providing a box or a basket of produce every single week. You pay usually up front in the beginning of the season for the season. So it's this really cool investment that you're making in your local community and sustainable agriculture. And then every single week for the rest of the season, you get whatever they're producing. So you might get your typical tomatoes and peppers and things that you might buy at the grocery store anyway, but you're also going to get new and amazing produce things that you've maybe never tried before, and it's the best version of them. It tastes so good when it's grown in season right where you live. I think it's the same one. Yeah. Now with this, we tried to, like, uh, what's the word? Uh, propagate? Propagate. It doesn't look bad. Yeah. It needs water. Yeah. What's this one? longevity spinach yeah it's very sagey I lived with Ellie in college yeah like all the Okinawa spinach that was we got to know each other so well like we lived so much life in those two years we had such a good time I was one of the RAs in her building you see this, um, cilantro over here too no you plant that no I didn't either you smell it no that's super like funny cilantro. I bet it was in the soil she was my maid of honor in her wedding that one I need to check Brian's video because that's the I didn't have enough of the things. But it's one of the spinaches. Oh, it's so the same good. as this one. And then there's longevity and Okinawa. Malabar? Maybe Malabar spinach. That's it. That's so good. good. And this is the moringa. Did you try that? No. Did you put that in the salad? Yeah. It's so good. Do you want some? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so good. Isn't this it is good? a superfood. Yeah, it's a superfood. When you buy this as a powder, it's like $10. Yeah. I had been living in China for almost two years, and Santi was moving to China to be with me. We were on a vacation and got stuck outside of China because of COVID. We couldn't get a flight back in. We ended up living in Sri Lanka for six months, waiting to go back to China and live in Beijing together, and realized that wasn't going to happen. What are you doing? Well, we were in Sri Lanka. Nina was up in the middle of the night with River. I was up at 11 and 2 and 4 and 6 all night. So we were texting all the time and I just got to like reconnect with Ellie on like a daily basis. We were trying to decide, okay, if we can't go to China, where are we going to go? And they felt like the safest thing to do would be to come back to the U.S. for a time. But they had rescued a puppy on the streets of Sri Lanka and nursed her back to health. She was a tiny little puppy and really sick with a lot of parasites and mange, a lot of problems. 
Ellie was saying, we don't know where to go because we can't just take a dog with us anywhere. And she flipped the screen to show out her window and she was like, you should live right there. Come to the farm. You should live in our yard. You can put a trailer there. It would be so easy. Come here. <laughs> Simple as that, she said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so bad. And we were like, oh yeah, whatever. Okay, cool. We'll live in your backyard. <laughs> and they live here now. <laughs> A long story short, Ellie and Santi basically said, are you serious? Like, is that actually okay if we move to the farm? That wasn't really in the plans from the beginning to just have other people living here in a vintage Airstream, but that's what's happening. Planning that whole move from the opposite side of the world was not an easy task. Trying to arrange for our dog to fly here with us was really hard, but... Everything fit. Yeah, everything life. fell into place. So they moved here about a month ago. Ellie's teaching at a school here. Santi's working with Brendan and my dad. It's such a cool setup that um, Curry, their little dog, is becoming friends with Olive. Not roommates, but landmates with one of my best friends is awesome. To have one of my best friends live, not even like neighbors, but like on the same property. It's really special. Here's our friend Curry. Curry! Hi. Curry and Olive have an interesting relationship. Curry really wants to be loved by Olive, but it depends on the day. But sometimes now they play, they run through the yard. Yay! Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Please love me. Please. Can we be friends? For lettuce, you can either harvest one leaf at a time from the outside and leave the center of the plant to keep growing taller and taller, or hack off the top a few inches from the base of the plant and it'll regrow. So we kind of do both, just depending, but right now we have so much lettuce. Ellie and Santi are using it. We made a huge salad last night. This was actually harvested kind of short. Typically, it would grow out of the center again, but this is gonna grow brand new plants off the sides, and this is edible. So you can basically just keep eating. Fresh lettuce is so good. And organic spinach and lettuce at the grocery store is what, like $7 a pound? It's a lot. And throughout the season, I pick off all this yucky stuff and feed it to the chickens. They love lettuce. So when my kids were growing up, there was an issue at dinner time just about every night. Nobody would eat their vegetables. Which is really an amazing irony now when I see Nina growing produce and eating produce and encouraging us to eat fresh, healthy, organic food. I think probably we have Brendan to thank for that a lot. So when we first got married, the only thing Nina knew how to make was scrambled eggs. And when I say make, she kind of knew how to make scrambled eggs. It was 20, okay. She was too busy to cook because she was graduating in two years. Now she makes scrumptious dinners every night of the week. I come home from work, everything's in order. No. River is giggling. No. You can't promise this false reality to yourself. We look out over the garden where everything's green and only good bugs are crawling. Delusional. This is just how we live. This is the most disgusting thing I do. Deep cleaning the chicken coop. Eggs are seasonal, which is not what people realize sometimes because eggs are always available at the grocery store. When our chickens aren't laying eggs, we just don't eat eggs. Like, if they're not in season for us, we give our bodies a break, we give them time to rest, you know. Laying eggs, definitely takes a toll on the chicken's body, even though that's what they're meant to do. It's a high protein, high calcium, high energy activity for them. So it's okay with us that they take a break for whatever reason. 
as long as they stay healthy. Speaking of eggs though, one of our favorite things to make is a frittata. It's a lazy quiche. This frittata is super delicious, so simple. That's the way I like to do it. We can cook everything in the skillet on the stove top, prepare it, dump the egg in it, and put it in the oven. The way that I like to do a frittata is to use usually whatever I have in the fridge. You might be catching on a theme here that I'm flexible and nothing is sacred. The steps to prepare the food have to be done kind of in the correct order, but what you're actually using when you're mixing different ingredients like this, you can use kind of just whatever you have. So first we're gonna steam the potatoes. That's kind of a weird thing I learned in a recipe a few years ago, but steaming potatoes makes them really soft, really creamy. I chop up really small, two cups of potatoes, and steam those. And then in the cast iron, we're going to brown ham or bacon for that salty meat flavor. I have ham, so that's what we're using today, but you can also do the same exact recipe with bacon. So once you're done browning the meat, you can spoon it out and save it on the side for a second. You're gonna have some of that flavor in the cast iron, so just add a little bit of olive oil and then saute the onions and the rosemary from the garden or really whatever herbs you like if you'd like to add in things that you have growing and then put your steamed potatoes in. That's gonna get nice and brown and delicious, a little bit caramelized. It makes the house smell good. Add in a bunch of spinach. We have random varieties, probably four or five varieties of spinach in the garden. We have kale growing. And so I'm dumping a bunch of that into this hot skillet at this point and it's gonna cook way down. Like you cannot put too much spinach or too many greens in at this point because it's gonna shrink to almost nothing. Crack your eggs. Depending on the size skillet that you're using, that's gonna determine how many eggs you need. I'm using eight for this size skillet. It's a 12 inch, but I also have a 13 and a half inch that we use 12 eggs. So the more the better in my mind, but don't do it too thick to where it won't cook. So crack all your eggs, whisk them up really good with some salt and pepper take your skillet off the heat. That's an important part so that the eggs don't burn on the bottom of the skillet. Really gently pour your eggs in on top of the veggie mixture. Add your ham or bacon, and then add a bunch of cheese. I'm a cheese girl, so we're gonna dump a bunch of goat cheese in this recipe. At that point, we're gonna put it in the oven on broil. This is so important. I literally sit in front of the oven to watch this frittata cook. The amount that it needs to be cooked, there's a very fine line. You like walk to the edge of the cliff, walk, 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 walk. If you accidentally fall off the cliff, the whole thing is ruined and your family's gonna be very disappointed. So our frittata's about to go in the oven, but it's time for a river to eat, so Brendan's going to bring it home. I'll just, I'll feed her and you do the frittata. Impossible. The eggs are gonna kinda get puffy and expand up. Everything's gonna get brown and delicious. You have to make sure it gets browned and it puffs up, but it doesn't burn. Nina told me that my job is to sit here and watch this to make sure it doesn't cook too long. After you sit in front of your oven and make sure you don't burn your frittata, um, I add more goat cheese. Surprise. This is also the best recipe for if you want to make it on a Sunday or Monday, you can eat it for the whole week. It reheats really nice. All these recipes, so that you don't have to remember this, is at thedirtacademy.com. You can click on them and print them out just like any other recipe so you can kind of get an idea for the steps and the different ingredients. When I'm feeling fancy, I also make biscuits. I'm actually like kind of embarrassed to uh, talk about like what my kids ate. I just wanted them to eat something. Nina's favorite was corn dogs, the frozen kind. Thank goodness she is past that and she is now producing enough food for the whole family to enjoy our greens. I feel for moms out there with these challenges, getting your kids to eat vegetables, but don't lose hope because one day they may grow up and have a farm. <laughs>
here you go. So most of the summer it rains every single day. I don't mind it. I like the rain, but it floods a lot. I would love to grow food in those huge front pastures, but like right now, if you walked out there, there'd be four inches of standing water. We could grow rice. I don't know anything about that. When I was in college, I had the very typical, what do I want to do with my life? I don't know what I'm doing moment. And my advisor said, Nina, you need to calm down. And I want you to go live on this farm in Indiana for the summer, for the growing season and figure it out. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And he had heard me just be interested in the farmer's markets and I was already studying environmental science and sustainability. So I drove up in my little blue Jeep to Wolf Lake, Indiana and spent the summer with a bunch of strangers. On my first day of class, my professor said, okay, everybody, we're gonna go around and say why we're here. And my answer to that question was like, I'm here because I need to find out why I'm here. I didn't know how to do any of it. I was clueless. It was all of a sudden my responsibility to take care of the chickens, take care of the guinea hens, take care of the gardens, working so, so, so hard. Uh, the rest of my classmates lived locally, so the intern and I were the only people that stayed on the farm on the weekends. So it was really quiet, it was super peaceful, and an experience that I probably would never have had otherwise. Brendan and I, we had gotten engaged three days before I went and did this whole experience. I came home and was like, babe, this is what we gotta do. We're gonna go start a farm somewhere. And he's like, uh, I'm an abandoned, we're about to travel the world together. Before Nina and I got married, I had a lot of fear about losing my dream of playing music. I thought maybe that when we got married, she would want to be at home and want me to be at home. So I kind of struggled with that and kind of said, like, this is what I'm doing. Like, are you on board or not? That's kind of the trajectory. It was like, how do I figure out how to grow food and live this sustainable agricultural way of life? and we're gonna be traveling the world. My two passions of being with him and traveling and living this agricultural way were a really interesting combination. And I did it, like we figured it out. At some point, kind of a stirring in me just like desired a little more regular of a rhythm of life. It was really cool to kind of see our passions like merge and just see like the next season approaching. And so it was less of a like giving up my dream as much as just like enjoying where I was in the season, but also seeing and sensing like there's this new thing coming and that's okay. It was the right thing at the right time. And we're so glad to be where we are right now. Wow. It wasn't the timeline that I expected coming off that season on the farm being like, Let's do it, this is what we gotta do. But now we're here and we live in this stunning place and every single person that comes here, I can just feel the energy chill. For me, after living in Beijing for two years, a huge city, 20 million people or more, um, now being here, experiencing the nature and the peace here, it's been really, really wonderful. Seeing our dog just completely thrive here, running around, having so much fun, being in the environment that she should be in is awesome too. There's rhythms and there's a time for planting and there's a time for cultivating and there's a time for harvest and then there's a time for all that to die. It's pretty redemptive to see at the end of the season when the plants crash and burn is exactly when I'm like done and frustrated and over it. It's therapy to be ripping the plants out and start fresh. Experiencing the seasons for the first time on that farm of waking up with the sunrise to slow down enough to really feel that agricultural way of life for the first time in my life. I came out of that summer really knowing that that's the way that I wanted to build my family around that sort of hands in the dirt, local community, eating meals together way of life. I've created my work to share. And so the Dirt Academy 
my business, my job, my heart is to be growing here on our farm and learning in my own space and then building gardens for other people and sharing what I've learned and also learning from them. Hopefully that's what we're figuring out. What's the ticket to contentedness and the peace of living alongside the seasons of the land. Playing in a band with the guys in the band. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, That's a really great sound. Sorry. Should have drank some of your coffee today. <laughs>